they're, they're not alive. I mean, imagine. I wasn't there, I walked into you. I was listening to this tilted slightly. Do you have something to prop it up on? Like what? Some very thing. No, that's too much. Okay. We're good. Maybe I should. So uh, we would first like to welcome a very special guest, uh, uh, founder of TGS and legendary uh, John Hi. And second of all, we would like to introduce our principal chair, Marshall, which will share with us some thoughts and insights about the term and about the showcase. to have you here and we want to talk to you a little bit about how learning happens at TGS. So today you will see presentations for, that are the culmination of all of the efforts uh, of our students uh, but not just the students we also have a collaboration or a facilitation from, from uh, our educators and our educators have been working hand in hand to make our project-based program work. We've also had the really uh, amazing opportunity to have uh, a collaboration with G-School, whose students are also in a project-based learning program and, and really validating uh, the style of education that is project-based learning and have worked with us uh, on several different initiatives to be able to uh, learn from each other and learn with each other. So thank you very much, G-School, for coming to our showcase. And we also are very excited to see you uh, showcasing alongside with us. So thank you very much. Um, I would... I would also like to thank uh, another very important group that has supported us in our project-based learning and also our travel around the world, and that is our parents. So thank you very much, parents, for showing up and uh, being a part of our showcase. I wanted to highlight uh, an example of what project-based learning and place-based learning can look like. I want to talk a little bit about a student who is not going to be up on stage, uh, and he might have a booth around where you have to seek him out, and it's uh, Raphael Walton. And the reason I'm talking about Raphael is because his project has exemplified what is place-based learning. So the project, and he's looking at me going, what are you talking about? His project, uh, is a photography project uh, that is looking at food or product, product pr photography and he's looking at the elements of marketing and how they integrate into um, photography. And he's done this in India, going to different restaurants and cafes and exploring how that works and getting a perspective of what the market, marketing strategies are like there and then continuing his project here by again going into restaurants, making those connections, so really uh, putting himself out there uh, to the point that he has uh, local cafe owners relying on him for their marketing. And so I just wanted to illustrate how it works in terms of project-based learning. Students are really embracing their passions 
and putting themselves out there and trying to connect with locals and really making it work. And that's the magic of project-based learning. And you will see he's just one example of many examples. Uh, at the end of our presentation, you'll see the boots uh, around the outside. And uh, in a very similar fashion, we have G School students who have a slightly different take on project-based learning, uh, but all the same, they have come here today to share their projects, and uh, their projects sequence a little bit longer term, uh, and so they'll be here to talk to you today. And I really encourage you to, incur to uh, talk to the students, ask them a bunch of questions about what their projects are about, what their experiences have, have been, and what their learning is about. And they'll be happy to share that with you. Uh, the, next the next group that I wanted to thank and that also contribute to making all of this work are our educators and staff members. So educators are here to facilitate learning. They're also here to facilitate experiences and they're out there in advance of students uh, securing guest speakers, looking for those experiences that will really bring uh, the projects to life. Not only are they doing that, they're also in a caregiving role. And that's really what adds to the intensity of our program, is looking out for the mental health and well-being of our students, their fitness, trying to keep track of their nutrition, uh, keep them on, the, on the, the right page moving forward to be healthy and active and really embracing our program. And it really, it takes a very unique person who can uh, travel alongside of students and not be the traditional classroom teacher uh, that is the purveyor of all knowledge. They're on alongside of the students facilitating their learning. And they are also a part of this magic. So thank you very much, educators, for all of your efforts. I'm going to hand it off now to the students because they are really the entertainers, the ones that are going to be on the stage presenting to you. And uh, without further ado, Yosef and Santi, thank you very much. Well, as Sylvia said, we are a continuity developer in many, many ways. And we are very, very proud today to present to you all the work, all the different experiences, projects that we had the opportunity to achieve during this module, during this month, during this country. So now Santiago will present us our next amazing group. What better way to start the Korea Showcase than with a little performance at K-pop? So please welcome a very special group of people who are going to be performing butter for us. So please round of applause for Thank you. 
knows how enthusiastic we have a bunch of projects going on, and it will be so hard for five students to find time constantly to work on this project. So that was a problem for us. And the very important problem was that we tried to make it a secret, but I think everybody here knew we can have it, so we felt it's so hard to hide something to the end. <laughs> But despite the challenges, we have learned so much through this project. We want to work as a team, be patient. Jenny had to be patient with us because we're not so good at this. <laughs> and we had to just, we, we learned to help each other and grow together and learn from our mistakes and, and be patient because we don't have a lot of time. And that's how we moved from a team like this. We were so lost at first to a team that is more unified than happy here and we'll be this performance for you today. So I want to say a bunch of thank yous uh, to all the people who made this project happen. And the first one is Sophie, because she was our <laughs> Because she was our project manager, she had the idea at first, she was the one who guided us all. Without you, we wouldn't have had that, so thank you so much, Sophie. Thank you so much. And of course, thank you to Shell, Rachel, and Matt for your support throughout this whole process. Thank you so much. Okay, now we've talked about the performance. I want to transition to my personal project that actually has many more aspects than only K-pop dance. My project is called Get It Fit With Sarah. Special thank you to Matt for helping me choose a name. But, okay, before explaining to you how did I come up with the idea for this project, I first want to ask you what, what comes to your mind when you think of the word sports? Sorry for this. <laughs> what comes to your mind? So, if I would have asked this question to me in the beginning of the term, I would have probably thought about quips or resilience. I don't know if that's the same thing that you thought about. But for me, right now, in the, I mean, uh, at this point of this project, when I think of the word sport, actually my definition or the word that comes up changed. The main word that comes up is happiness. And really my goal during this uh, project was to explore the relationship between sport and happiness. Um, and I did that through this driving question. And it's how can I experiment Different sport activities to personalize a fitness plan with the aim of achieving physical goals in a psychologically enjoyable and motivating way. Okay, basically, what I've been doing in this project is that I tracked a bunch of sport activities, running with Chell, special thank you for Chell for running with me, uh, dancing with Jenny and Sophie, thank you so much, hit workouts with Tibeta, I love your morning workouts, thank you. And walking with Nico or other people who just like put on the chat, let's go to walk. Thank you so much for that. It was really lovely. Um, and what I try to do is investigate my happiness before and after I do each of those activities and see if there is a correlation there. But while I was doing this project, I saw a correlation between this project and my math project which is about visualizing, visualizing data uh, about happiness. And one day I had a discussion with Alara and she asked me a question that made me think a lot. And it was, when I'm actually calculating or measuring my happiness, what am I actually calculating? Is it my level of energy? Is it my level of contentment, peacefulness? It's actually a very broad topic, I just realized that. And then, the things I'm calculating are not accurate. Like, I, I don't really know uh, what part of happiness am I calculating or measuring. And so, at that moment, I wanted to discover more about this concept of happiness. How do, they, well, how do people look at it? What do they consider as happiness exactly when they, talk, when they say I'm happy? Um, and I really wanted to do it in this environment here with students from all over the world. Maybe their background influences how they see happiness. 
that's how I wanted to collaborate with Alara to start the Happy Club, uh, which was really a club where we were trying to talk about happiness and concept related to it. So for example, our first meeting was really just talking about how each member looks at happiness. What does it mean to them? Um, and we also tried to look at how to get it. And, and I really love that concept. So we, we're now trying to dive deeper into it and go to other topics, such as the abundance mindset. I just want to say a special thank you to Alara for collaborating with me in this project. It was amazing. And thank you to all the participants. It was also really nice having this conversation. I learned so much. I'm really, really grateful. Okay, so what did I get out of this? What did I learn? Basically, I was able to be more emotionally aware and, and really kind of break down my happiness and the different components of it. So there is the motivation, peacefulness, excitement. And how did that impact, impact my sport project? Basically, I was, a, I was able to look at how sports affect me in different lenses. So I see how which kind of sport um, gives me more motivation versus gives me more contentment, which makes me, for example, if, if I want to choose, I mean, a day where, oh, I lack motivation, I will know which kind of sport to go to versus if I want more excitement. And now I am going to extend this project to next term as well, where I want to be collecting more data. And my final project will be to create a happiness toolkit that I want to share with my community, to share with them how I have been um, looking at the relationship between sports and happiness, and encourage them, if they want to do the same, to understand more about their feelings, their happiness, and how can they get it through the different ways that I've been experimenting. I want to say a big thank you to Sophie. It's very <laughs> She's my project mentor, and it was really, really interesting to talk to you. I got so many interesting insights. So thank you for that. I really hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. And I just want to end by saying thank you for all your beautiful smiles today. <laughs> Well, thank you, Sophie. Uh, well, this was a very insightful project that provided us a little bit a wider image of not only the motions in our body, but also our physical activity and the collaboration that we can have, and all this collaboration among different things that we can do in a project for the TDS. Very happy, folks. The true key to being happy is not skipping leg day. <laughs> so now we're going to have some people who have looked at K-pop, maybe not as flexibly as the other people who have done before, but what they have done is now a minor miracle. They've fully gone into the underground scene of K-pop here and they've come out victorious. So please welcome Minayel from Pakistan and Gabriel from Ecuador. <laughs> Good morning, good evening, everyone. How are you doing today? Hope you're having a great time. And well, my name is Gabriel. And I'm And we are going to present our psychology K-pop module, which is called K-pop Miracle. <laughs> So our driving question for this module was, how can we apply the psychology of the success of K-pop marketing to strategize influence and growth for a local business in Seoul? Well, let's talk more about K-pop. K-pop has become this last year a global uh, influencer music heard all over the world, increasing fans and a lot of people to, music, to listen to this music. It also, K-pop also helped to increase more popularity and be aware about the culture of Korea. Throughout our module, we had the opportunity to learn about different types of marketing, namely digital marketing and traditional marketing. And they're exactly what they sound like. In digital marketing, you use digital means in order to promote your products and services. And in traditional marketing, you use traditional means. 
So digital means would be like social media, influencer marketing, email marketing, and traditional would include newspaper advertisements, signs, posters, billboards, word of mouth strategies. Yeah, so talking about what have we done here in Seoul, we wanted to, we look into the basis of marketing as well, knowing more about uh, K-pop and yeah, the undergrowth K-pop, as Sandy said, as well as the coffee, as the coffee influence and yeah, impact in the city. While we were in Seoul, we had the opportunity to conduct market research to better understand the customers' experiences in these K-pop cafes. We also interacted with different marketing agencies to understand how they organize themselves and how they structure themselves because it's a very complicated process. And we also had the opportunity to consult with our clients to better understand their needs so that we could design marketing plans that would better serve them. Also during our weeks, we we'll have the opportunity to visit the major for city of Busan, which has become through the years for a point of cultural exchange and an intercultural place for South Korea and all over Asia. While we were in Busan, we got the opportunity to understand how the city brands itself using MICE tourism, which stands for marketing, sorry, meetings, incentives, conferences, and exhibitions. And Busan is actually using this strategy in order to secure its place as the host of the 2030 World Expo. We also had the opportunity to visit different types of cafes other than K-pop themed cafes in order to understand how the general industry works in South Korea. For example, we went to Cafe Momos, which hosts the world's fastest barista, which is absolutely incredible. And we also visited Cafe Magnet, which is owned by BTS member Jimin's dad, and we had the opportunity to meet him. And if you want to know how exciting that was, you should go and ask Sophie. <laughs> understand half of these cafes use their unique identities in order to create marketing strategies that best serve them and we use this as inspiration for our own plans yeah so we divide our module into two different marketing uh, agencies so this my group cafe bug uh, uh, my group was composed by Renan, sarah and joseph and the second group was Aryan, which was my group, and it's called Aryan because we are on our way to your success. <laughs> and in our group, we had Urushi, Ari, Tsuruv, Louisa, and me. So we want to talk to you more about our marketing strategies that we have the opportunity to apply to our cafes, to our cafes. So. So this is Cafe Blood. Cafe Blood is located in front of Hive Entertainment uh, building. If you don't know how, what is Hive Entertainment, it's basically the record label that produces artists such as BTS or New Jeans. Uh, yeah, the particularly uh, about this K-pop cafe is that they call a lot of uh, K-pop merch, uh, yeah, K-pop related uh, frigates. As well, they also hold events for K-pop communities such as they celebrate uh, K-pop idols, birthdays, or celebrations. So we wanted to, with that insight, we work in three strategies for this cafe. We wanted to increase our interactivity between clients and, ca and cafe. As well, we wanted to increase our online presence, how we can reach to a wider audience, and as well, we proposed to our clients a future plan so she can apply uh, yeah, through time. So one of the first inter interactivity, we wanted to our clients feel more engaged with the with the cafe. So we installed a photo wall and a writing booth. The photo wall, well, since we identified the target audience was mostly foreigners or tourists, it was a fun place to leave your memory. A, yeah, a photo of you that you visit the cafe is a fun and interactive way to start with cafe. As well, the writing booth where you have prompts prompts where you can write comments about how you're feeling, what is your opinion about this, about that, and it's just another fun, interactive way to interact with your company. We also wanted to increase our social media presence by using social media ads so we can uh, yeah, reach to a wider audience and also use other digital marketing uh, techniques as like search gene optimizations, which helps to increase the visibility online of the cafe. So we, uh, one of our future ideas was to create a, a dream theme about a K-pop or an idol. Uh, so you have here the example of Army April, 
that is inspired of BGS. So this idea is basically a monthly drink that the cafe will have, and it will, uh, yeah, will attract will attract clients that like BGS, and then from other uh, groups, K-pop groups, and yeah. So now passing to the so visit Cafe Bot is a really nice, fun place. You can interact with the photo with the writing book, and enjoy for a good coffee, good music. And in case you didn't know, that was a marketing strategy right there. Word of mouth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so moving on, our cafe worked with Black Drum, and in order to design a marketing plan that would actually work for them, we wanted to understand who we're working with and what they already have at their disposal. So there are a lot of cafes in Seoul, and K-pop themed cafes are a very niche market specific to South Korea, but even within this market, our cafe was even more specific. We were working with a cafe that was only BTS themed, so we had very specific people to work with. And it's located right next to Hive Entertainment, which made it the perfect place to find the ARMY members. In order to align our expectations and work better with our with the cafe owner, Tiffany, we met with her to discuss our ideas and create our plan better. And we also recorded content that she could use to advertise the cafe online. And in order to understand the customer experience better, we, we created and distributed surveys for them and conducted interviews with them. And what we found was a lot of them are based outside of Seoul, but the biggest thing we learned was that all of them love the idea of any sort of event which resulted in free gifts, like game nights, lucky draws, whatever. A freebie was always welcome. So for our marketing plan, we decided to host a BTS-themed game night. This had three parts to it, a trivia section, guess the BTS member, and guess the BTS song. In order to bring more people to the cafe, we used the word of mouth advertisement, social media promotions, and free awards as incentives. And as the outcome, we had 14 people come to our event, and it was quite successful because everybody who showed up got a participant gift at least, and Tiffany helped us out with that, and that is some of the things that we gave to them, but it was a lot more. And for our digital marketing section, we decided to create a separate account for our agency because we wanted to establish ourselves as a separate brand than the cafe. And over in two days, we were able to get 69 followers and reached 756 accounts. Um, and this was done through paid adverts mostly. And we decided to separate each social media platform for a specific function. So Twitter was used for general announcements, while Instagram was used to build a deeper connection with the customers, such as through promotion posters and video reels about the behind the scenes process. And for our future marketing strategies, we advise that Tiffany hold more lucky draws and game nights because that's, a, that's always a great incentive to get people to come. We had a few people in our game night as well who weren't particularly BTS fans, but they showed up for the gifts. And we also thought that this would be a great opportunity for her to establish uh, partnerships with, uh, with businesses that were creating BTS themed products. And finally, because our cafe is great, but it's on the opposite side of the street from other K-pop cafes, so we suggested that she put up signs and posters on that side of the street to get the customers over to her side. And finally, for our digital marketing strategies, we realized that a lot of people engage the most with video-specific content, such as reels. So that is a great opportunity for the cafe to connect with the customers and to build a greater online presence. And other than that, paid advertisements are also a way to get people to come in because you can specifically target people. When it comes to BTS, they have, their target audience is usually young people, and even within that, it's young women. So these ads can be specifically sent out to them in order to gain greater um, customers. And our other two recommendations were to increase online fan engagement through live streaming and to use SEOs in order to make themselves appear higher on search results on Google, which is used by foreigners, and Naver, which is used locally. Now, what did we learn, Dave? So, of course, during this module, we learned three main important things, of course, marketing, collaboration, and communication. So we learned that marketing is a science that also needs a lot of creativity, a lot of market research to target which type of audience we want to work and look for, and to give a plan and a structured idea to our clients to apply. As well, collaboration by every or group was divided into the different skills 
uh, of our members, and by, but all the time having support between each other. We also learned a lot about communication, specifically communication across language barriers, because we are not good at speaking Korean. And we had to constantly navigate that in order to build a better understanding of, it, of the cafe that we're working with. And also, we learned a lot about online communication for brands specifically. Yeah, we're going to give special thanks to Joe, who is a, the owner of Cafe Bar. Please round of applause for that. Thank you for making this possible to open the, the, your doors for our cafe, to, to play with it, I, I experimented, it was such an experience, I love your time and collaboration. We also want to thank the owner of Cafe Black Drum, Tiffany, who really facilitated us and let us run free with our marketing plans, and she supported us so much throughout the entire journey, so we really appreciate that. Finally, we want to give a shout out and a, a show of gratitude to all of the guest speakers that we had. TGS is a very place-based and project-based curriculum, and we would not be able to carry out our projects or have the learnings that we do without the support of all the guest speakers, who really instilled so much wisdom in us and guided us so much throughout the process. So we really appreciate all of their support. Also want to thank so much for <laughs> Chris and Sophie, thank you so much for making this opportunity for us to make it so so fun, so interactive for all the connections that you made and to make this an uh, incredible learning experience. And it also shows good pictures of you, so you're welcome. <laughs> so yeah, thank, thank you, you very so much. much. And please be the best of us. <laughs> interesting module in which I was also there. We learned a lot. We, again, thank Chris, Sophie, which happens to be popular today. Uh, well, definitely a multi-task experience that allowed us to go further in our learnings through experience-based and on-site learning. So yes, very, very interesting experience. So to guide our learners through this module, we have the Brighton question, how do you design modern day nutritional meal plans that consider its horrible depictions, medicinal food properties, and sustainable food systems? So based on this, our goal for this module was to experience sustainability, nutrition, Korean food, and based on this, we will look at a specific target audience and then look at their food, meal plan, and all that in order to create a nutritional plan. Throughout this launch book, we had a bunch of experiences which were really amazing. Uh, some of them included the Guangdong market uh, here in Seoul and the Jeju market in Jeju. 
Um, so in the March and Market, we got to review and experience different foods, different flavors, things we've never tried before. Some were amazing, some not so much. Um, but it was all really a really cool experience. And uh, if you would love to see our reactions, the funniest reactions, uh, you can head over to Ayasi if you want to booth after these presentations. And in JG, we did the same thing. We got to experience different um, flavors and things we've never had before, such as my personal favorite, tangerine fried chicken which is amazing. <laughs> um, so these are some of the experiences that we did, and it was really, really cool. So we actually connected with a professor from Korean University, Sonia, and she graciously invited us into her home in the mountains to experience a fun day of cooking and playing. We made japchae, which is like traditional Korean noodle, and we made ramen, which is Korean dumplings. Um, and she focused on a meatless diet and sustainability, so we were able to see everything in action. Um, she also invited us out to a frozen lake to play all day. So it was a day full of fun and food. <laughs> so then after, we went for temple cooking. So basically, we had a catering set trying different temple foods, bringing the foods, and giving our reflections. And after, as you can see, we had a workshop where we learn how to cook with um, soybean paste, rice paste, and all that, and we have something to that over here at Material Cooking. So yeah, that was really cool. Thank you. Um, another really important key part of our experience was learning the medicinal and side of food. So we were invited to a Seoul a medical center here in Seoul, and we were invited by a chef who had a platter of ingredients for us which were, and she explained the health benefits and how they contribute to different organs in the body. We also got a really cool experience in terms of cooking the, these ingredients and these breads and trying them to making a traditional tea, which is a very special moment for us as a community and the start of our cooking journey. So from We Explore, we traveled to Jeju Island where we collaborated with a sustainable zero waste restaurant called Last Spring Jeju. And there we actually visited a farm and we picked our own vegetables to cook. And after that, we visited a fermentation farm where we explored the traditional processes of making soybean paste. And with that, the next day we were able to visit Last Spring in Jeju, which has a beautiful location next to the sea. And we were able to make our own dishes, as you can see here. And the head chef of Last Spring Jeju, Chef Kong, was able to show us how to make these dishes. Uh, so before we go any further, we'd just like to say how, <clears throat> mention how this module was mainly built on all these activities for a clinical lesson without our guest speakers. These are some really key guest speakers that I'd like to give a shout out to. Professor Sonia, first of all, the professor at Korean University, who not only gave us the basis of our nutritional, overall, the nutritional needs in food, with a lecture at the university, but also invited us to her home where we had so much delicious food, where we got to make food and play in the snow as well. Um, when we traveled out to Jeju, we had Chloe, who was with us every step of the way, guiding us and telling us about the culture and the food culture in Jeju, as well as the philosophy for her restaurant that she shared with Chef Tang called Last Spring Jeju. She was the manager and she taught us all these things and um, we're really appreciative to her for that. And last but not least, the main man, Chef Kang. Uh, so he is the head chef of Last Spring in Jeju, and he told us, he showed us different sustainable techniques on how to prepare food. But some of the key parts of their philosophy, for example, was zero food waste, and they were really, they had a massive emphasis on farm to table, and they picked the only ingredients from the farm and brought them to the table for us to enjoy. So a big shout out and thank you to all of them. Now, after all these learning and experiences, we had final product, which was divided into three states. Target audience were, were like, all of us had to look at different people, rather if it was athletes, singers, or ourselves, and we had to look deeper into their nutritional needs. So then, gathering all that information, we went on to meal plan, which was basically creating a full meal plan, including main dish, drink, and side dish, which made all of these international needs. So for example, I did a target audience with a marathon runner, so they needed a lot of carbs for energy and protein for 
most of the building. So for example, my new fund, my main dish was a green bath, which is a traditional dish here in Korea, which has rice, beef, and vegetables. So that was perfect for my target audience. I wish all of our knowledge from experiences with guest speakers and with our meal plan, we were able to experiment for two days in the kitchen. Um, as you can see here, we had a lot of different dishes. We had salmon, we had granola, um, yogurt, we had ramen, bibimbap, um, and we were able to learn how to collaborate in the kitchen to make delicious meals. So that's all from our part. Thank you so much. And we also want to thank so much Vega and Adam because this one has been really good and it would be possible without them. So thank you so much. Well, such a delicious experience. <laughs> yeah, I, I can tell you, it, it was very good. It's incredible the amount of extra motivation you get when you know you're going to be eating your final product afterwards. <laughs> so now we move on into the future with Drone to Busan module, who have worked really hard on terms to create some amazing drones that can identify people and can be used for a wide array of things, like crashing into your person to your roommate. <laughs> That's a secret. Um, but anyway, please welcome the Drone to Busan module to stage. I'd like everybody to get their iPhones out if you have one, so we can airdrop those pictures that we just took. That's the one in our beloved audience, so bear with me for one quick second before the drone master himself begins, so you can have these beautiful pictures. Okay? Because everybody's airdrop on. Oh, I don't see that many airdrops, but let the airdropping begin. Okay, now you guys can get them from each other. We'll figure it out. <laughs> but I would like to introduce Vito, the drone master himself. Well, thank you very much, Rap, for the introduction and for taking photos of Vito and Juan and the audience. So I'm very excited to be here today. My name is Vito. I'm from Cairo, Egypt. Um, and we were talking about uh, drones. Uh, we have been exploring drones in South Korea specifically, and actually what Rav just did was far from what we're exploring. Rav was controlling it using remote control. We have been exploring more of the autonomous drones. Um, so in a way, how can we create an independent uh, drone that does some sort of a task, uh, while also con considering the ethical and societal uh, uh, implications of such new technologies. Um, and so our Driving question is actually how effectively um, can we utilize the latest drone technology to solve some sort of a problem uh, or create a service uh, while considering the ethical or societal implications of automated technologies. And to break down this driving question, um, yeah, to break down this driving question, uh, we kind of divided the module into three different components. Uh, the first component was led by Andy. Um, it was the ethical component of drones. 
Um, so I want you to imagine this scenario. You are a drone researcher, um, and you want to create um, a drone for a fancy, luxurious house that does some sort of a surveillance system, right? Um, and it sounds like a really cool idea at the beginning, but think about it. You coded the drone to face track people. Are these faces stored somewhere in a database? So does that raise privacy concerns? Is that even the biggest problem? I mean, the owner of that house, he fired the security guard because he has a new drone for surveillance instead. So is that affecting the workforce? Or oh, is it creating new job opportunities for developers? But imagine this. Maybe the drone fails at some point, and then it hits someone, and it harms someone. Are you, the developer, responsible for such consequences, or are we just going to send the drone to jail? <laughs> so all of these ethical um, things, uh, we, had, we had really important conversations, because before getting into the science and actual programming, uh, we had to uh, go around the ethical dilemmas and answer the question, just because we can do it, should we be, should we be doing it? Um, but moving forward in the more practical parts in the science and technology, it was led by Kesley. She did an incredible job in introducing physics to a, like, a very diverse level of student with very diverse experience in physics. Um, and we, uh, we got to know like sensors and drones, how infrared sensors work uh, and such, uh, but also connect that to programming, which was, uh, um, well, not, not to be biased, but I think it's the most important part, so I guess. <laughs> Um, I was very honored, thank you very much uh, for having this opportunity. I was very honored to uh, be the programming educator for this module. Um, my role was to uh, set, set people up for the path for that product that they envision in mind or the solution that they want to create um, and give them some kind of a path, uh, but also offer them the services. So for example, uh, I introduced Scratch, uh, if it's a total beginner, if you're a total beginner in coding, I introduced Scratch and block-based coding. If you're intermediate, we got into more computer vision and Python and how we can use artificial intelligence for drones to create more complex and sophisticated uh, um, autonomous drones in general. And so, sorry. So, um, although I was teaching this module, I also wanted to create my own final product. And it was kind of hard because of the time crunch that we have here at TDS. However, um, I had two two main things that I wanted to investigate. First of all, I have a lot of experience in programming, but I've never programmed drones before, so it was kind of learning while teaching experience. Um, however, I also wanted to specifically uh, investigate the potential uses of brain-computer interfacing and drone technology. So I want, to, I want to ask all of you guys a question. Do you think you can control drones with your brain? No. Raise your hand if you think so. Cool. Um, this was a hypothesis that I had at the very beginning of the term, and I would have said no, actually, like seven weeks ago. Um, however, um, I was actually, uh, for my master's project, I was investigating brain computer interfaces. There are these devices, not very popular, but they have been uh, around for quite a lot. Uh, they are used in clinical research. Um, they use it to, like, to, to measure if someone is about to have a seizure, for example. Um, so they were mainly used uh, in medical fields. Uh, people would not be considering them with like cars uh, or drones um, or, or like co controlling your computers. It was just um, some kind of uh, like a doctor or a therapist to use. Um, however, I have been investigating that part of the biology behind that and the neuroscience behind that. Um, and on the other hand, I was investigating teledrones. Um, so here, to answer my hypothesis, I actually had Adam, and thank you for being here. Um, I had Adam think about moving his left arm, and I made a correlation that whenever the brain-computer interface detects the thought of Adam moving his left arm, the brain, that, well, the telegram should make a flip. Okay. Kezi, can you play the beat? <laughs> So here, once um, the confidence rate goes really up, 
the drone makes a flip. And since it's always up, the drone keeps making flips and flips and flips. It means that Adam is constantly imagining himself moving his left arm. And for me and Adam, it doesn't necessarily might not mean anything. But if someone has, you know, like, who has a Lockton syndrome, this means too much. This drone can be an, uh, an assistive technology for them. Uh, like literally, this is active control, but with brain computer interfaces, you can do so much more. You can do, not necessarily just by imagining things and active controlling things, but you can also use passive control. Um, so um, for example, here, I have my, this is the brain waves that are, well, collected from Adam. So. Um, and if you break them down, right here, they're not classified into alpha, delta, but they're just from the sensors. For example, the first sensor here, it goes into that uh, vision and perception. So when Adam, well, closes his eyes, these brain waves are going to change in frequency. But then you can classify them more um, into, well, alpha, beta. So for example, if the alpha wave has a certain frequency, you know that Adam is more focused or more calm, right? Um, and then, well, if he's not focused or he's not calm, we can play music that stimulate those brain waves. And this is passive control. You don't consciously control something, but you're passively controlling it. Um, and you can do that with drones, or you can do that just with your computer. It can be used for meditation, and it can be used for all sorts of things. Uh, so it, pro it proves that the quality of life um, for very, very like different applications throughout, you know, all technologies. And this, I've been like very excited to investigate that. that. Um, and actually, just a little bit of how like the theoretical part of it works. How I actually was able to correlate the thought of moving the left arm to the drone making a flip. Um, well, I asked Adam to best, like, well, I didn't tell him to imagine himself using, that, like, lifting his left arm at all, but just closing his eyes or opening his eyes, but just resting in a constant state, measuring his brain waves like that, and then measuring his brain waves while he's imagining moving his left, his left arm, comparing them both together, and then there is, a, like, a spike that happens every time he thinks about moving his left arm, and then connecting that to the teledrone as a computer as a little man. So what happens is, bring computer interface, Computer, drone, sends data, and then data back, right? Um, so that's what I've done so far with the you know, brain control drones. Um, and I see a lot of potential in that. You can be in your car um, and having the electrodes in your head. I mean, I don't know who wants to do that, but sure. Uh, it can detect, for example, it, it can be very useful for people who um, have a history of seizures, for, for instance, because it can detect um, if you're about to have a seizure, and if it's a self-driving car, for example, it will stop, right? It will just go sideways and stop. Um, so, yeah, it can be used for that, it can be used for entertaining for healthy populations, and more. Um, so the next thing that I have, well, speaking of self-driving cars and autonomous drones, um, and also learning by um, myself to teach people, um, here I have done a computer vision program um, that kind of calculates, well, detects my hands and my hand gestures so I can control the drones with my hands. When they touch, there is a little green thing that pops, right? So this is just using my webcam. Um, and then with the other right hand, um, like you can see also the, kind of the distance between the two coordinates, and I can control the drone's altitude just <laughs> literally just moving my fingers. Um, so there's a lot of yeah, a lot of potential we can use in uh, computer vision. It can be also correlated with brain computer interfacing. So if it's, well, um, for example, if you're if someone is controlling a wheelchair using his brain, uh, you can also have computer vision to uh, obstacle avoid things, right? Um, and it's just, it, it's all about the intersections <laughs> within STEM and technology. So here was a little uh, experiment. Um, this drone was face tracking me, so whenever I move back, it tries to come <laughs> forward for my face, but not actually hit it, so it maintains some kind of a distance. Uh, but also, when my two index fingers touch, it should make a flip. Just like Adam did it with his brain, but just with my hands. So yeah, it made it. Yeah. Um, so that's about it for my project. and. Um, I would like to thank again uh, Kenzie and Adam for, for and Andy for this amazing module and Adam for participating in my experiment. Um, yeah, thank you so much for yeah just giving me this opportunity. I think it's awesome. I would love to maintain the momentum of innovation, although that I'm kind of graduating TJS, which is quite nostalgic. Uh, but yeah, I, I'll be around. I invite you to talk to me if you're interested, um, and we can talk about like the opportunities. I'm very open-minded. So thank you very much.
My name is Sigurd. My name is Max, and I'm Australian. I'm from Norway, and we're here to present facial recognition and drone warfare. So, our, we have a drone here. You programmed it to recognize faces. Go towards the faces, as you saw in Peter's video, and then do something when it gets close enough to the face. So, we're going to run it. It has a paper cup on it. There's something inside. You'll see. <laughs> All right. So this drone is going to now come up to an attitude, and it is going to utilize its camera, as you saw on this, to, as you saw Peter show, to recognize a face and move towards that face, aka me. So wish me luck. It's now looking for a face. Give it a bit of time. It has so you, you have seen my face. And now it's going to go crazy. Also, if you saw, that was confetti. It got blown away by the wind, but there was confetti in there. And it's gone. Now, that was clearly not the plan, but there is a very important thing to be said, because this drone saw my face, positioned itself from my face, and there are some serious ethical implications of that. This leads me very well into our next slide, which are the ethical implications of facial recognition and drone warfare. Imagine if that was a grenade. What, what would have happened? I'm dead. <laughs> Half the people in this row are dead. That was not the intention. That was not my intention. I was trying to do good, but if that thing has a grenade on it, it, it accidentally blows off because something went wrong with the drone. I presume the projector interfered with the drone's sensor so it couldn't really see my face well. If something goes wrong like that, and you have something dangerous attached to this drone, severe problems can come from this. This can have severe consequences. So even though I'm a high school student trying to do something cool with confetti, if a military tries to do this, what happens? Um, well, Sega will be talking about our word for her. As you guys know, he knows a lot about this. Be careful, he might kill you. Um, you know, I'll be talking more about other aspects that don't involve that much work. So we have to think about, and all the examples that we get of facial recognition and drones that can be used, they are both divided into two different aspects. It's the aspect of facial recognition and tracking, that this can be used for governmental control and the invasion of privacy, in which the drone is able to recognize faces and follow them. And the other example would be um, facial recognition and the drone does certain information with it. For example, uh, it can be like for convenience, like shipping, and it just drops it in front of you. Or it can also be used in entertainment, as we just seen. Or for example, in a concert, in which the drone is localizing where the camera should go, focusing on the face of the artist and the movements that the artist does. And there are also some extreme uh, implications of this in, within warfare. One of the first ones is genocide. Because yes, this drone was programmed on a general data set that can identify any face. But if you tweak some data of that data set, you will be able to identify faces based off race, based off ethnicity, and you could even use it in conflicts. You can imagine that conflicts such as World War II may have been much more effective at executing crimes against humanity if they had drones flying into people's houses rather than people going into people's houses and looking for them. There are also ways of using this within more conventional warfare that doesn't break the Geneva Convention, which is, for example, planting mines, proximity explosives. You could have this thing move according to when it sees a hostile enemy and, for example, explode itself or drop a bomb. And it can do that. Uh, additionally, this can be used for good. I mean, if you're looking at it from a military perspective, that is. You can reduce friendly casualties by recognizing enemies from foes using, for example, if you have some special type of face paint, or if you've trained it to recognize people that are within your group, it may see them and may stop, not do the explosive. And it can also be used for dropping supplies, as well as avoiding to kill civilians, because using, as Peter said, object detection, one can also see whether this person has a gun or whether this person doesn't have a gun, so maybe don't drop the explosives on the civilian. And you can also 
make more ethical deaths by making it much more effective at, instead of chucking your grenade at someone, accidentally hitting their leg, it will now drop it on them and make sure it hits their head. So yes, this raises a very big question because I managed to do that and almost hurt myself. If a, if a military does that or if a terrorist organization does that, what happens? Are these really ethical to have in the sky? Just something to think about. Thank you so much. less harmful. Uh, we want to present to you what's the future of art and technology using um, jokes. I'm Riley from Mexico and I'm Isha from Malaysia. And in our project, we're not trying to kill anyone. <laughs> we're just creating art. Imagine a future where you have a photograph on your wall that was actually produced by drones. That was what we were going for with our project. We basically attached an LED to a drone and we made it, we programmed it. We programmed it to create a predetermined flight path. An external camera on the long exposure setting will track this flight, flight path and capture it in an image. And that is the art that we're creating. So our process to create this image is to first identify what's going to be the design that we're creating. So once the design was created, we decided to put it into a chart and identify which were the coordinates, because that is the language that um, our drone was going to identify. So once we identify the coordinates, we pass it into Python code uh, in order for the drone to, um, to fly. So in this video, you will be able to see how our drone is following the path of a square. Um, it has the it has an LED light attached, and you can see how it's following a square. Now, you're gonna see how we are holding the torch of our camera. You might say, well, why are you doing that? So one of the our limitations of this project is that in order to have a long exposure photography, you need very low source of light apart from, the, from that LED light. But in order to have an automated drone flying, you need this you know, fly so it can recognize the port. So that we need, we need to find a violence and a solution for that. So here's our final product. Um, in an ideal world, we would want the background to be darker, but as Marley explained, we had a limitation because we needed light, but we also didn't need light. And we also would want to make the image more detailed, but we couldn't do that because the longest setting for our camera was 30 seconds, and our drone took way longer than that to actually finish the whole image. But I think this is just a glimpse to what the future of art and technology is. In the future, I don't think it's gonna be all the brushes and paints. I think it's gonna be drones, it's gonna be automated codes, it's gonna be any type of technology. So be prepared for what the future brings. Thank you. My name is Rafael Waldman, and I'm from the U.S. And I'm Raya, and I'm from Bangladesh. So basically, we've looked at how drones can be used in art. we looked at how drones can be used in some other ways, um, maybe not as happy or as playful. Um, but our focus is to see how drones can be used to put out wildfires. Because obviously, in today's day and age, wildfires are becoming more and more common as a result of climate change. So we thought, hey, why not use the technology that we have to come up with a new solution? So, this is it. So, what exactly was our product trying to model? 
Of course, we don't have all the money in the world and we don't have the best equipment, but we can still make a good old-fashioned attempt. But what our model, which Raya is going to demonstrate, was trying to model, is basically drones that can send data to firefighting teams very rapidly. So think about it. If there's a wildfire, what would you need to do right now to see how big that wildfire is and get data on it? Probably you need a few firefighters to go up in a helicopter, see the whole thing. This isn't time efficient, wastes a lot of CO2 emissions, super costly, and very dangerous, considering that helicopters are flying in smoke. Whereas when we use drones, this could happen super efficiently and super easy. And those drones could be at that wildfire within seconds, representing super accurate data and sending that to firefighters. So they could better help identify the different parameters of the fire and therefore find the best path to put out those wildfires. So, those drones could have heat detectors, which basically could show the firefighters the hottest parts of the fire. It could also 3D map the entire wildfire, which could show the firefighters on the ground where exactly is the fire, where is it spreading, are there any civilians in danger, etc. So now, Ryan and Jiva is going to present how exactly we use object identification to model this. So uh, we basically coded our drone to detect objects. Um, object detection is basically a computer recognition technology that already Pedro talked about. And we use that to detect and locate objects. So our main goal was to detect fire, smoke, people, trees, like everything related to wildfire, and send real-time data to the firefighting team so they can stay aware and it can also send an alarm system like if it sees a smoke and if it like earlier detects it and sends it to the firefighting team they can put it off and which can potentially save lives and saves a lot of damage and property. So how did we do it? Um, we used Python to code our program and especially we had to use three libraries. Um, it's CVZone, OpenCV Python and Digital Python. Um, now I'm going to show a quick demonstration of how our drone detects objects. <coughs> Okay, so as you can see, this is the code I wrote for object detection, and now it's going to fly up, more up. Oh, can I, can I get 
about lighter and using lighter um, and slam technology, we can maximize the scope of this drone. So it can not only detect, but use the technology that Sigurd has been using, that's like facial recognition, so it can follow it and then detect it. So we, this also comes to, um, brings us to the ethical implication of it. So we must not use it to any, to any harm of people, of our environment. And we can, here we, we didn't use a thermal camera, but if we used it, it could also detect heat. And detecting heat, it could go to a place and then detect smoke, fire, which could maximize its impact and scope. Um, thank you so much. Everyone, my name is David from Nigeria. And I'm Junia from Pakistan. And today we're presenting our drone module project, TT Delivery. So drone technology, as you've seen, has the potential to, has the potential to change our world. It is in the future. For our group, we looked at drone delivery, leverage, and exploring how we can leverage the latest drone technology to deliver packages more efficiently and securely. From our research, we've seen that a lot of companies like Amazon Prime Air and Wing are currently working on this, but they use a door-to-door -door delivery system. In fact, they're heavily invested into, in this, but they use a door-to-door -door delivery system. But for ours, we decided to take a different approach, identifying some of the limitations it has, such as privacy, safety, security, and efficiency. So first, when it comes to privacy, here in South Korea, we face that issue. We cannot fly drones everywhere. There are, uh, there are private properties and lands. So how would we make, how would we make drones know the safe road to go to? So here we're going to use the mission pads or big points that will locate and help the drone navigate its road. Other issue is safety. Uh, when it comes to door-to-door -door delivery with a drone, there is a one-to-one uh, -one interaction of a human and a drone. So how could we avoid that interaction? Because it's not safe. Because not everyone knows how to interact with the drone. So here, we have a middleman, which is going to be our Dropbox. To ensure the security of our Dropbox, we're going to use a password or a face ID to make sure that our customer could get their purchase uh, very secure. And last but not least, efficiency. So drone delivery is going to make it much more clear to deliver parsley from one place to another because the drone is going to navigate and find the quickest way to deliver parsley. And it's also going to be cheaper. Next slide. Okay. All right, so here's a model that showed what we did. Um, so the drone hovers in the air, it identifies the mission pads as various pinpoints, so it knows how to get to the Dropbox location. So when it sees the first one, it recognizes it and it shows that, oh, I see the first mission pad. It knows to turn 90 degrees and then moves to the next one and so on and so forth till it finally lands home in the Dropbox with your item. That was, it, uh, that was it about our delivery drone, and that's the end of our drone module presentation. Thank you so much, Andy, Kenzie, and Vida for this amazing module. And now we're going to talk about Davis Project, ABC D Derivatives. So we were going to take a fourth break. So we're not gonna go on for any longer. We're just <laughs> gonna stop for a bit and we'll be right back with David here and the project. So thank you very much. There is a 10 minute break. Maybe we should put this down so that nobody like walks past. Oh yeah? Like pause it? How do you pause it? I don't think that's a way to pause it. Uh, smile, you're on camera, I guess. I don't know. Should we just put it like down so it can't yeah. see anything? Bang. Easy. Uh, uh, Angela. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You too. Yeah. You too. Did you enjoy? 
How do we? Can we comment? Yeah. 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 Break? No, yes. I actually. Can you can you join the thing? Yes, please. So I live in Colorado. So it's actually really nice. How do you mute this thing? Sure. Yeah. Mute my.
Here we go. We are resuming the live stream very shortly. Okay, so, well, a um, very interesting presentation regarding our past, our present, and our, and our future about the technological developments. And now we are going on a very different page, talking about TGS and the behind the scenes of it. Yeah, so we want to stay with David um, in Canada. We're going to talk to us about his math project, ABC derivatives, and how people use it to streamline Twitter. A lot of people, you know, are ready to see. Yeah. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is David once again. I'm from Canada, and today I will be presenting my math project for the term. A, B, C, derivatives. So this is just a general scope and outline of my presentation today. My driving question for this project was, how can I develop effective teaching strategies and resources that help new learners to understand calculus concepts more easily and, to, and actually get to implement, implement them in live tutoring sessions? My goals and motivation for this, I wanted to explore how I could develop quick, fun, and informative training modules that would enable people to understand cal basic calculus concepts, especially the ones that I know I struggled with when I was being introduced to companies for the first time. I also wanted to see what I could learn from others, in this case my students, by being open to their unique perspectives and new methods. And this is called the Protege Effect, where te teaching others to improve my own understanding of the material. So to accomplish this, I partnered with Schoolhouse, which is an online platform that connects learners and teachers from around the world and brings them together to interact with each other, share their knowledge and expertise, and to help each other out. Over the course of the break, I went through a certification process to get certified to teach certain topics in calculus and pre-algebra. And during the term, I hosted about seven sessions, impacting nine learners from seven different countries, like Hong Kong, India, Lebanon, and I've seen nine positive readings, which is 100% uh, positive learner feedback. I also leverage technology, like Nearpod, thank you, Andy, and Khan Academy, um, using this to make the most of my dreaming sessions. And to attest to that, here are some of the feedback I received from each of the classes. Cool, so I will never forget the first class that I had. I was tutoring an adult learner from Turkmenistan in pre-algebra. He is an incredible guy. So he was talking to me about some of his experiences and his background, you know, dropping out of high school and currently as an adult not being able to afford to go back to school, and generally had this undeniable interest in love for math. I was completely <coughs> blown away by his energy, by his enthusiasm. Like, I, I, can't, I can't remember the number of times he would repeatedly say, David, I can't believe this is possible. Like, he was just so excited. Also because he had me pie that day, but generally because he was just really excited to learn and really excited to know more about math. And even though it was like a big, like it was pretty algebra, the excitement he had was just so contagious. And um, this kind of changed my perspectives because in the in future classes, rather than coming to just you know teach so I can understand the material better, I began to teach um, knowing that I was making a positive impact in people's lives. These 40 minutes or 60 minute sessions were making a difference in people's lives. So shout out to all the educators at TGS. Shout out to shout out to all the educators at TGS. Shout out to parents who teach their children. Shout out to teachers who teach uh, students. Shout out to students who teach each other. Like Vito helped us for our drone module. Like the fact that you wake up each day to, and choose to make a difference in people's lives and choose to help them to learn, that is incredible. So this is where I am right now, and what I can, what I want to look at in the future is how I can incorporate um, various means like. Um, multimedia and video animation to make my classes more interactive and engaging. So yeah, this is what I've done for my math project and I hope and looking forward to continuing to work on this in future events. Thank you. Well, as we saw, Education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. Uh, we have just been the presence of a very interesting project that managed to combine many things into one thing, focusing on math. 
Uh, now we'll go to the next project. So, as a project-based learning community, who always strives to know the world around it, we're always on the lookout to find similar and like-minded individuals who will try to understand the world around them better. And we had the luck here in Seoul to find an entire community of them. So please give a, round, a warm round of applause for these whole community who have... <laughs> So first off, we have Ria Kim with uh, their project surrounding um, fashion culture and how to make it more sustainable. So please, um, on the stage. We are running out of time. According to the Mercury Research Institute, we only have six years left until our planet temperature passes the 1.5 degree mark. 1.5 degrees doesn't sound like much, but it means everything to our survival. The recent COP27 in Egypt warned that to avoid a major environmental crisis, the world has to cut more than half of its greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Let that sink in for a moment. Human survival is at risk. Our survival is at risk. And we only have six years left. We are Gen Z. We love fashion. Fashion is how we express who we are. We buy lots of clothes, we get bored of them, throw them away, and we buy some more, and we don't think twice about it. We are guilty of speeding up the environmental damage without even realizing it. According to the European Commission, fast fashion is one of the major causes of environmental pollution. Let's do a little less, shall we? In 2030, we are going to be 24 years old, having fun, pursuing our career, challenging ourselves to new experiences, filled with hopes and dreams. But all of this may end up as wishful thinking, because in 2030, our reality could be very different. In 2030, this could be our new reality. As a generation who has the buying power to dictate the trends of the future, the responsibility first on us to make a change. We care about the planet, but we also want to look good. We don't want to wear the same old clothes day in and day out. We still want to enjoy the latest trends and freshen up our clothes at each season. So, is there another way? Introducing Refit, a sustainable fashion exchange platform. A lot more clothes than ever before. But the number of times the clothes are worn is decreasing. Our clothes are full of clothes and never them we never wear. So we keep on buying new clothes. Great is a fashion exchange platform with three key features. First, it helps users easily catalog and keep track of the clothes in their closet. The three feet users can register and organize each article of clothing in the app digital closet. 
to add information such as the longer here and storage here. Second, it helps users with the clothes they no longer want to wear on the exchange market. Users can easily swap clothes using the ads exchange coupon with the listed platform or versus search can be another person treasure. Third, Liquid is a community platform. Users can actively share sustainable fashion practice and their stories. Sharing contributes to a circular economy and shifts the attention away from production to new and more sustainable way of consumption. This is 23 years old Kim Sumi. She is a Gen Z fashion lover who spends much of her time on social media. She also enjoys shopping online. She is interested in sustainable practice like veganism and eco-friendly consumption, but as much as she wants to practice sustainable consumption, it is not that easy. First, when it comes to eco-friendly fashion, the options are limited. Second, eco-friendly brands tend to be expensive. Third, she feels at the end of the day, she is still simply buying more stuff she doesn't need. Sumi wants a platform where people like her can openly talk about sustainability without being judged. Over the past year, we have talked to many consumers. We have discovered that they want what Sumi wants. By creating a culture of sharing and exchanging, we hope to change the way things are. A widespread Culture of exchanging will create a secondary impact where designers and companies stay away from low-cost and poor-quality goods. Exchanging could highlight the need for values such as quality, durability, and longevity. So, you might be wondering, how is Refit any different from other platforms like Tangan Market? The biggest difference is our exchange comfort. People don't buy second-hand clothing, they simply exchange it. We hope to reach a measurable target of recirculating 100 items in the 12 months after the at lunch. And these are to change we are hoping to start. We are Team Refit. We develop, we create, we promote our vision of creating a culture of sharing and exchanging. As renowned British fashion designer Osula de Castro once said, the most sustainable garment is the one already in our wardrobe. Thank you for listening. Mahatma Gandhi said one day, be the change you want to be in the world. <laughs> um, well, that truly was an inspiring um, agent, and we, we're not going to stop with that. Uh, uh, we have now uh, Shumin Choi with their presentation about making board games to make uh, reading fun and leisure for teenagers. Good evening, everyone. I am Sumin Choi from our team, Reading Car. So th there was this kind of situation with my friends. They were told to hand out their homework on Korea, which means today in Korean. But because the spelling was similar to the word Friday in Korean, they thought the word was Friday. And eventually, they couldn't make it to the deadline. Have you ever imagined a world where people read a text but can't understand its underlying meanings? Well, you can stop imagining because this is the reality we're living in right now. Teenagers can read, no problem, but they lack literacy skills to understand the intent, underlying meanings, and analyze what they're reading. One out of four students in Korea lack literacy skills needed, uh, one out of 
but poor students have difficulties in reading. According to the OECD, teenagers with a low level of literacy skills increased 2.6 fold in the last 12 years. Literacy skills are crucial for communication. If 25% of the population lack literacy skills needed, this negatively impacts the rest of the population. Why? Because communication is a two-way process. Then what can be done to improve literacy skills? The answer is very easy. Reading. But not just reading, but reading a lot and deeply. But teenagers nowadays simply don't read enough books. They say reading is boring, and they're not interested in it, period. So instead of telling them to just read many books, the first thing that we should be thinking about is how to motivate the students to read, to make the act of reading enjoyable and even fun. Introducing Missing Link, we have created a board game designed to make reading fun and easy for the teenagers. We came up with an original detective story that is broken down into 40 story cards. Each story card contains a picture and a short text to read. Solving the crime is the fun part that will motivate the students to read till the end. The board game has three key features to help the students improve their literacy skills. First, we have included five methods of reading from the Korean standard textbook. And while they read, they can naturally experience those key reading skills. Second, they can learn CSAT and school vocabularies through our cards, because our cards contain the vocabularies and their definitions to learn. Third, studies show that the people with a low level of literacy skills also lack analytical skills. So we provided, set of a question, we provided some set of questions to help them analyze while they read. We have designed five of the MVPs and ran MVP testings on 100 teenagers. After the prototype tests, they told us they were motivated to read more, and they gained more confidence in reading. 92% of the students said they had so much fun playing the game. The students had just had fun solving the case. And what they don't realize is that they read 3,100 words in just an hour. We're actually selling the board games, and Missing Link is available for purchase right now. We have sold it to the schools, and we ran some of the board game workshop programs for the students. We were able to raise $10,000 in 30 days through our successful crowdfunding campaign. We also participated in the Korea's largest board game festival and took part in the selling the board games. And through our collaboration with Edunity, which is an education platform for teachers, we were able to raise $6,600 in the course of three weeks. In total, we generated $17,200 in the course of seven weeks. We are actively marketing our products on five of the social medias here to teachers and teenagers. Through our YouTube and TikTok channels, we have proven to be popular among teenagers and teachers, um, raising 5.5 million views. With a marketing cost of zero. Um, moving on, we are working to collaborate the, with the Office of Education in Korea. And we're now making a new board game series to expand our target consumer group to elementary school students. And we're planning to set up a corporate body to make this business more sustainable. Literacy game application is also on our way to be launched in June this year. We are Team Redeeper. I'm the CEO, I'm Sumin, the CEO, and we have designer Tansin and marketer Nayeon and Sangyeop as our project manager. Over the past 20 months, we have participated in a number of business contests. We also won many awards, including the Minister's Award. And we also have applied for two patents for board game and the game application. Remember, 
The literacy skills are our life skill. As teenagers, it is our mission to help fellow students to improve reading skills and communicate to the world. To then, Read Deeper will lead the literacy education. Thank you for listening. Well, extremely interesting project. Uh, reading is like dreaming, but without eyes open. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting initiative and for this interesting proposal you are making to all of the teenagers that would really appreciate it. Great. Now we have a project by Dr. Jim from G School, which is targeted to making, uh, helping blind people navigate the public transport system here in Seoul. So, do you feel often do you often feel frustrated because of things that you don't get? Okay, thank you for your time. Do you often feel frustrated because things don't go the way you want them to? Even the smallest things can bother us multiple times a day. Things like dropping your brand new phone or running out of toilet paper in the middle of the big room <laughs> or super small or something. How long are traveling? I'm sure that you have experienced many I'm sure that you have experienced many frustrating moments during your travel. So these situations are triggered and we forgot about them and go on our ways. But what if this but what if these frustrating situations don't go away? Have you used the bus or something during your stay here? Seoul has one of the most convenient public transportation systems in the world. However, not everyone can access it. Today, I'll talk to you about 250,000 people in South Korea for whom this is everyday reality. We are Kim Omnibus. We are working to improve the mobility of visually impaired. As of 2019, the rate of bus use for the visually impaired was 21.1%. That means that 8 of, 8 of 10 people with visual impairments are unable to use the bus. The number of bus users with visual impairments are significantly low compared to other forms of disability. To address this problem, a petition was submitted to the presidential office calling for change the petition was signed by 3,700 people. Why are the buses, which are so necessary for the visually impaired, so inconvenient to use? According to Seoul Institute, the main problem is insufficient information. It's, this means that important information, such as location and arrive time, to, time of buses, is not communicated properly to the people with vision with vision of the disabilities. Here are the three key problems that is indefined by interviewing people with various level of vision loss. The first is not knowing the arrival information of buses. Most user impaired people obtain bus arrival information through audio service installed on the bus stop. However, it is not easy to hear the audio announcements to traffic noise. Second is not being able to find the, their bus when several buses arrive at the same time. Oftentimes, several buses arrive at the same time, but the audio announcements, but there has no service to tell the order in which buses have stopped. Lastly, difficult to know their access location when they are on a moving bus. Inside of the running bus, it is very noisy and difficult to hear the audio announcements. If they miss the audio, they can get up, 
they cannot get up and their intended destination. All of this inconvenience occur because information is not being converged properly to those with vision impairments. Introducing Tabo, the real-time app, the real-time bus information app for the visual impaired that is easy and available to use. Let's take a look. This person is using the Tabo app to catch the bus. He turns on the app at the bus stop, then selects the departure and arrival stops. After setting the information, the user can put his phone away. The alarm goes off. Looks like his bus is about to arrive. The bus is coming in. But wait, there are three buses coming in at the same time. The user turns on the camera. He takes a photo of the bus to check the bus number. The app checks that the user is safely on the bus. If the user misses the bus, a window automatically pops up so the user can book the next bus. If the user misses the audio announcement inside the bus, the app informs him exactly which stop he is currently at. This is his stop. The app checks whether the user got off the bus safely. If the user misses his stop, the app informs him to get off at the next stop and automatically resets the route so that he can get to his intended destination. Countless missed buses. Being frustrated at bus stops. Not knowing when to get off and feeling lost. With Tabong, these are now things of the past. Of course, all good things must be shared. But his friend is having trouble making out the information on the screen. No problem. Simply go to settings and select a different color contrast. Much better. Over the past two weeks, we conduct a prototype test on a group of users with vision impaired. We asked them to rate a bus. We asked them to rate an XT visual scale 1 to 5. Tabon received a 4.7. On the 16F, we are rating of 2.6. Based on our analysis, our potential user who used the public bus, who used the public bus 15 times a month on average, will use 31 times a month with help of Tabon. Our main target user are those with low vision, who make up 80% of the 250,000 blind population in South Korea. We are Kim Hong Bus. I am iOS developer Kim Go Young. Kim I is the project manager. Since 2021, we have seen dozen of dozen of protests near our school on Southern Line 4. We we naturally became interested in the mobility rights of disabilities. Over the last 18 months, we have met with dozen of people with vision impaired. We heard them. We heard their side of story. For them, the struggle is real, all because their basic rights are not guaranteed. For us, what started as the school project has become much more personal. The people who will share their story with us and, un and encourage us from day one are, are the reason why this app existed today. The word bus came from the Latin word omnibus, which means the whole. We believe that a safer mobility for the blind can begin with Tabo. Thank you. Well, interesting project, very insightful presentation, uh, very progressive, a very ambitious project that well, hopefully can be get done in society in some parts of the life. So, uh, we would like to invite uh, also Marshall for some closing remarks for uh, tonight's show.
I'm just going to make some space for our booth, so I'm going to go quickly and uh, give thank you to the many uh, facilities and organizations that have helped us. I'm going to say a quick thank you to those that are, uh, we know not to be here. So, Mr. Kim uh, from our High Soul uh, Youth Hostel, uh, Debbie King from IBIS, who has been so helpful to us. Um, we do have here Hyun um, uh, Suk. Uh, from the Learning Adventure, if you could come forward and we have a presentation for you. Call me? <laughs> <laughs> Please come up. And uh, we also would like to uh, acknowledge your uh, colleagues, uh, Jin and Lee and Jiyun. If Jiyun is here, come on up. I don't think so either, so I'm just going to present this uh, to you on uh, their behalf, so thank you very much. The Learning Adventure has been uh, our platform for uh, making connections in the community and facilitating uh, some of our experiences, so thank you very much. Uh, we would also like to uh, call up to the stage uh, our collaborators here today. Uh, from G School, Eureka Park, and Jim Beck, and also Kayu Kim. Tutelage, and, uh, so was, uh, but one of his terrific assistants for that module is a uh, big round of applause for Peter. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, at this 
time, we really welcome you to uh, take a walk through the booths. Uh, if you are presenting at a booth, we ask you to make your way to those booths. And, uh, and we'll just spend the next uh, 10 minutes or so going through the booths. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for attending, and we invite you to the booths. Okay, we can spend some time in 20 to 25 minutes. Awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah, she was doing it to you as well? Yeah. She was doing it to us too. Okay, shoot. How do we end it? Uh, Wait, was that live stream? Yeah. Where? Insta? YouTube. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. Okay, give a close up, please. No, give a proper close up. Either way, it's fine.